Six. I miss crime. On the afternoon of June second, Max opened the door of his San Jose duplex to greet Chris Beeson and registered instantly that he was in trouble. There were three other suits with the FBI agent, including Beeson's surly boss, Pete Trahan, head of the computer crime squad. The month after the bind attack had been a busy time for Max. He launched WhiteHats.com, and it was an instant success in the security world. In addition to housing his scanning tool, the site collected the latest CERT advisories and links to bind software patches, as well as a paper Max had written dissecting the ADM worm with the clarity and the discerning eye of a connoisseur. Nobody in the community suspected that Max Vision, the rising star behind WhiteHats.com, had personally provided the brightest example of the seriousness of the bind security hole. He was also continuing to file reports to the FBI. After his last one, Beeson began emailing to arrange a casual meeting, supposedly to go over Max's latest findings. How about if we just meet at your place? Beeson wrote. I know I have the address somewhere around here. Now that he was on Max's doorstep, Beeson explained why they were really there. He knew all about Max's attack on the Pentagon. One of the men with him, a young Washington, D.C.-based Air Force investigator named Eric Smith, had traced the bind intrusions to Max's house. Beeson had a search warrant. Max let them in, already apologizing. He only meant to help, he explained. They chatted amicably. Max, happy for an audience, grew expansive, describing the twists and turns of his attack and listening with interest as Smith described how he'd tracked Max through the pop-up messages Max had used to alert himself when a system was subverted. The messages went to a Vario dial-up, and a subpoena to the ISP produced Max's phone number. It hadn't been difficult. Max had convinced himself he was doing something positive for the Internet, so he hadn't done much to cover his tracks. The feds asked again if anyone had known what Max was up to, and he said his boss was involved. Matt Harrigan, Digital Jesus, had not completely given up hacking himself, Max said, adding that Harrigan's company was about to get a contract with the National Security Agency. At the agent's behest, Max wrote out a confession. My motives were purely for research and to see if it could be done, Max wrote. I know this is no excuse, and believe me, I am sorry for it, but it's the truth. Kimmy came home from school to find the feds still tossing the house. Like grazing deer, they looked up in unison as she entered, dismissed her as unthreatening, then turned wordlessly back to their work. When they left, they hauled Max's computer equipment with them. The door closed, leaving the newlyweds alone in what was left of their home. An apology formed on Max's lips. Kimmy cut him off angrily. I told you not to get caught. The FBI agents saw an opportunity in Max's crime. Trahan and Beeson returned to Max's home and gave their former ally the score. If Max hoped for leniency, he'd have to work for them, and writing reports wasn't going to cut it anymore. Eager to make amends and determined to salvage his life and career, Max didn't ask for anything in writing. He took it on faith that if he helped the FBI agents, they would help him. Two weeks later, Max got his first assignment. A gang of phone freaks had just hijacked the phone system at the networking company 3Com and were using it as their own private teleconferencing facility. Beeson and Trahan could dial into the illicit chat line, but they doubted their ability to blend in with the hackers and gain any useful intelligence. Max studied up on the latest phone-freaking methods, then dialed into the system from the FBI's field office while the Bureau recorded the call. Dropping the names of hackers he knew and drawing on his own expertise, Max easily persuaded the phone freaks that he was one of them. They opened up and revealed that they were an international gang of about 35 phone hackers called Darkside, living mostly in Britain and Ireland. Darkseid aspired to unite freakers and hackers all over the world into one big digital army, according to the group's blustery manifesto. But at root, they were just kids playing with the phone, just as Max had done in high school. After the call, Beeson asked Max to stay close to the gang. Max chatted them up on IRC and turned over the logs to his handlers. 
Pleased with Max's work, the agents summoned him to the Federal Building in San Francisco a week later to brief him on a new assignment. This time, he'd be going to Vegas. Max's eyes moved over the nest of linen-clad card tables in the gaudy exhibit hall of the Plaza Hotel and Casino. Dozens of young men in T-shirts and shorts or jeans, the hacker's uniform, were at the tables, hunkered over a bank of computer workstations or standing on the sidelines, occasionally pointing at something on a screen. To the untrained eye, it was a strange way to spend a weekend in Sin City, banging on keyboards like some anonymous cubicle drone, far from the pool, the slots, and the shows. But the hackers were in pitched competition working in teams to penetrate a clutch of computers hanging off a hastily erected network. The first team to leave their virtual marker in one of the targets would claim a $250 prize and valuable bragging rights, with points also awarded for hacking other competitors. New attacks and ruses were flowing from the hackers' fingers, and secret, stockpiled exploits were being pulled from virtual armories to be used in public for the first time. At DEFCON, the world's largest hacking convention. The Capture the Flag competition was Fisher versus Spassky every year. Kimmy wasn't impressed, but Max was in heaven. Across the floor, more tables were cluttered with vintage computer gear, odd electronics, lock-picking tools, T-shirts, books, and copies of 2600, the Hacker Quarterly. Max spotted Elias Levy, a famous white hat hacker, and pointed him out to Kimmy. Levy, a.k.a. Aleph One, was the moderator of the Bug Track mailing list, the New York Times of computer security, and the author of a seminal tutorial on buffer overflows called Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit that had appeared in Frack. Max didn't dare approach the luminary. What would he say? Max wasn't the only law enforcement mole at DEF CON, of course, From its humble beginnings in 1992 as a one-off conference pulled together by a former phone freak, DEFCON had grown into a legendary gathering that drew nearly 2,000 hackers, computer security professionals, and hangers-on from around the world. They came to party in person with comrades they'd befriended online, present and attend technical talks, buy and sell merchandise, and get very, very drunk in all-night bashes in the hotel rooms. DEFCON was such an obviously target-rich environment for the government that the organizer, Jeff the Dark Tangent Moss, had invented a new convention game called Spot the Fed. A hacker who thought he'd identified a G-man in the crowd could point him out, make a case, and if the audience concurred, take home a coveted I Spotted the Fed at DEFCON t-shirt. Often the suspected Fed would just give up and good-naturedly whip out a badge, giving the hacker an easy win. Max's mission was broad. Trahan and Beeson wanted him to chum up to his fellow hackers and try to get their real names, then lure them into exchanging public PGP encryption keys, which security-minded geeks use like sealing wax to encrypt and sign their email. Max's heart just wasn't in it. Writing reports for the Bureau was one thing, and he had no qualms about getting the goods on the dark side freaks, who were too young to get in real trouble. But this assignment smelled like snitching. Personal loyalty was written deep into Max's firmware, and one look at the DEF CON crowd told him these were his people. Many of the hackers were reluctantly giving up childish things, migrating into legitimate dot-com jobs or starting security companies. They were becoming white hats, like Max. A popular t-shirt at the conference summed up the mood, I miss crime. Max shrugged off the FBI's edict and began attending the parties and the talks. On the roster this year was a much-anticipated software release by the Cult of the Dead Cow. The CDC were the rock stars of the hacker world, literally. They recorded and performed music and infused their conference presentations with over-the-top theatrics that made them media darlings. At this DEF CON, the group was unleashing Back Orifice, a sophisticated remote control program for Windows machines. If you could trick someone into running Back Orifice, you could access their files, see what was on their screen, and even look through their webcam. It was designed to embarrass Microsoft for the shoddy security in Windows 98. 
The crowd at the back orifice presentation was ecstatic, and Max found the energy infectious. But of more pragmatic interest to Max was a talk on the legalities of computer hacking by a San Francisco criminal defense attorney named Jennifer Granick. Granick opened her presentation by describing the recent landmark prosecution of a Bay Area hacker named Carlos Salgado Jr., a 36-year-old computer repairman who, more than any other hacker, represented the future of computer crime. From his room in his parents' house in Daly City, a few miles south of San Francisco, Salgado had cracked a major technology company and stolen a database of 80,000 credit card numbers, with names, zip codes, and expiration dates. Credit card numbers had been hacked before, but what Salgado did next assured him a place in the cybercrime history books. Using the handle SMACK, he jumped into the hashtag carding chat room on IRC and put the entire list up for sale. It was like offering a 747 for sale at a flea market. At the time, the online credit card fraud underground was a depressing bog of kids and small-timers who'd barely advanced beyond the previous generation of fraudsters fishing receipt carbons from the dumpsters behind the mall. Their typical deals were in the single digits, and their advice to one another was tainted by myth and idiocy. Much of the conversation unfolded in an open channel where anyone in law enforcement could log in and watch. The Carter's only security was the fact that nobody would bother. Remarkably, Salgado found a prospective buyer in hashtag carding, a San Diego computer science student who'd been putting himself through college by counterfeiting credit cards, getting the account numbers from billing statements pilfered from the U.S. mail. The student had mob contacts who, he believed, would buy Smack's entire stolen database for six figures. The deal went south when Salgado, looking to perform a little due diligence, hacked his customer's ISP and poked through his files. When the student found out, he got mad and secretly began working with the FBI. On the morning of May 21, 1997, Salgado showed up at a meeting with his buyer at the smoking lounge at San Francisco International Airport, where he expected to trade a CD-ROM containing the database for a suitcase packed with $260,000 in cash. Instead, he was arrested by the San Francisco Computer Crime Squad. The foiled plot was an eye-opener for the FBI. Salgado represented the first of a new breed of profit-oriented hacker, and he posed a threat to the future of e-commerce. Surveys showed that web users were anxious about sending credit card numbers into the electronic ether. It was the number one thing holding them back from Internet purchasing. Now, after years of struggling to gain consumers' trust and reward the faith of investors, e-commerce companies were starting to win over Wall Street. Less than two weeks before Salgado's arrest, Amazon.com had launched its long-awaited initial public offering and ended the day $54 million richer. Salgado's IPO was higher. The credit card companies determined the total spending limits on his 80,000 cards amounted to over a billion dollars. $931,568,535 if you subtracted the legitimate owner's outstanding balances. The only thing he'd been missing was a NASDAQ to trade on. Once the underground figured out that part of the equation, it would be an industry of its own. As soon as Salgado was arrested, he'd confessed everything to the FBI. That, Granick told the DEF CON hackers in her presentation, was his big mistake. Despite his cooperation, Salgado had been sentenced to 30 months in prison earlier that year. Now, the FBI wanted me to tell you that it was good for Mr. Salgado that he talked, Granick paused. That's bullshit. Just say no, she said, and cheers and whistles swelled from the audience. There's never any good reason to talk to a cop. If you're going to cooperate, you're going to cooperate after consulting with a lawyer and cutting a deal. There's never any reason to give them information for free. In the back of the room, Kimmy prodded Max in the ribs with her elbow. Everything Granick was advising computer intruders not to do, Max had done. Everything. Max was having second thoughts about his arrangement with the feds. 
We need to make some changes in the way we do business. Max could feel the frustration radiating from his screen as he read the latest note from Chris Beeson. Max had returned from DEFCON empty-handed and then blown off a meeting at the Federal Building at which he was supposed to get a new assignment, pissing off Beeson's supervisor, Pete Trahan. Continuing his email, Beeson warned Max of dark consequences for continued flakiness. In the future, missed appointments without exceptional reasons will be considered uncooperative on your part. If you are not willing to cooperate, then we have to take the appropriate actions. Pete is meeting with the prosecutor on your case Monday. He wants to meet with you promptly in our office at 10 a.m. sharp, Monday, 8-17-98. I am not available next week. That is why I wanted to meet with you this week, so you're going to have to deal directly with Pete. This time, Max showed up. Trahan explained that he'd become interested in Max's boss at MCR, Matt Harrigan. The agent was alarmed at the idea of a hacker running a cybersecurity shop staffed with other hackers, like Max, and vying for a contract with the NSA. If Max wanted to make the FBI happy, he had to get Harrigan to admit he was still hacking and had played a role in Max's bind attack. The agent gave Max a new form to sign. It was Max's written consent to wire him for sound. Trahan handed him a bureau-issued recording device disguised as a pager. On the way home, Max pondered the situation. Harrigan was a friend and fellow hacker. Now the FBI was asking Max to perform the ultimate betrayal, to become Digital Jesus' real-life Judas. The next day, Max met Harrigan at a Denny's diner in San Jose, without the FBI wire. His eyes scanned over the other diners and looked out the window into the parking lot. There could be feds anywhere. He pulled out a piece of paper and slipped it across the booth. Here's what's going on. Max phoned Jennifer Granick after the meeting. He'd gotten her card at the conclusion of her DEFCON talk, and she agreed to represent him. When they learned Max had lawyered up, Beeson and Trahan wasted no time in officially dropping him as an informant. Granick began phoning the FBI and the prosecutor's office to find out what the government had planned for her new client. Three months later, she finally got an answer from the government's top cybercrime prosecutor in Silicon Valley. The United States was no longer interested in Max's cooperation. He could look forward to going back to prison. 7.